Welcome back. Um, the focus of the passage is one person. It's that person, Thomas. Uh, we read about him in verse 24. Now, Thomas, called Didymus, was not with the disciples. He's a man who reacts very strongly to uh, what he's told by those around him. He refuses to believe. It's not uh, a gentle child say, I won't play. I'm not going to join in. Verse uh, 25, uh, unless I see with the nail marks in my hands, in his hands, and put my fingers where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. Um, what does God do about a person like Thomas? Jesus had appeared already to the other 10 surviving disciples. He'd made himself clear. He'd made himself known to them. He made it clear to them that he was alive. He'd brought his peace. He'd uh, uh, shown his love in the way that he dealt with them. But Thomas wasn't there. And I suppose the first question is, does Thomas matter? Is he worth coming back for? There were 10 disciples, weren't there? They were aware of his presence. They knew they were able to testify. They were able to say clearly what they knew that they'd seen. And yet Thomas, yes, Jesus talks about him doubting later, but it's much more than the sort of thing that we'd think of as doubt. It's an absolute rejection, a denial of the things that the other people that he'd known, the other 10, Peter and, and James and John and Andrew and all the other disciples, he just rejects what they had to say. And yet Christ comes back for him. This meeting on this second appearance, this second uh, appearance that uh, John himself recalls that week later, is for Thomas's benefit. Let's be absolutely clear about that. It's for him. And there's a reminder, isn't there, of those um, three stories that are, are described as a parable in Luke's Gospel, in Luke 15, where Jesus talks about 100 sheep, one was missing, and the shepherd went to find them. Ten coins, one went missing, and the woman turned the house upside down to find that missing coin. And the two sons, one who ran away. And his father kept looking out for him and ran to him when he returned. It's a reminder of just how important individuals are in God's love, in God's care. And that is despite what Thomas has done. We've heard very recently about a, a slogan of Black Lives Matter. But God's slogan, if you're going to call it that, is all lives matter. Individuals matter. We're told in that parable that there's rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents, one sinner who's saved. And that is so important. God doesn't look on humanity as some sort of amorphous mass. He looks at individuals. He knows the hairs on our heads, we're told in another place. He knows the secrets of our hearts. And he shows his love for us as individuals. And that's typified by this coming where he comes to Thomas. And you see how he comes. He doesn't come to condemn Thomas for his reaction. He doesn't come to berate Thomas for his refusal to listen to the other disciples. He comes and he just very gently, very uh, appropriately, because he deals exactly with the things that Thomas said. He says, here's the evidence. You asked to be able to put your finger in my, in my um, hands. See the nail marks. Put his hand in his side. Here my hands. Here's my side. He gives Thomas the evidence 
for him to change, to be transformed as he comes face to face with the risen Christ. But it isn't without its challenges because he tells him to stop doubting. In verse 27 at the very end, stop doubting and believe. Presented with the evidence, presented with the certainty that Jesus Christ truly came back to life from the dead. What is Thomas going to do? And that's been true for the last 2000 years. There is evidence and in many ways the key, the most crucial evidence remains the evidence for the resurrection. As many of you know, I still uh, practice, I haven't got to, to any sense of perfection yet, practice as a lawyer. Coming to retirement, so that I won't be able to say that for much longer. But it's been interesting over most of my Christian life that again and again you come across books that's, and material and other information that look at the evidence for the resurrection. They look at it from the point of view of lawyers. I remember one of the first things I ever read as a, a young student by a then professor of law at the School of Oriental and African Studies. Other books written by uh, Christian lawyers uh, in the Cheshire area. Books written and things commented on by judges because the evidence for the resurrection is something you can look at you can assess and you can know whether it is true or not one of the best known books not written by a lawyer uh, was written by a journalist it's entitled who moved the stone and that had an influence on a generation of christians in the 70s and 80s and i'm sure it's still available but uh, if you can get a, get a copy, J. Andy Anderson's The Professor of Law, his book, The Evidence for the Resurrection. It's only a very short book, but it's wonderful to re read, just to go through. What that evidence shows is that, well, some of you will know that there are two uh, levels of um, proof depending on which court you use in the UK. Some is just that the balance of probabilities, is it more likely or another? The other one is that it's beyond reasonable doubt. That's required for criminal matters in court. And I'd like to suggest that if you look at the evidence of the resurrection, it is beyond reasonable doubt that the only true outcome, the only true answer you can come to is that Christ did indeed come back from the dead. He did indeed rise on that first Easter Sunday. And that evidence is there for you to look at, to consider. And if you want help, I'm sure uh, Rob or others in the leadership of the church will be only too happy to, to provide you with information to talk to you about it. But like Thomas, the challenge for you is not just to look at the evidence, but to do something with it to stop doubting, to stop being uncertain, to come and to say, well, are you going to believe or not? The focus in this passage is on that one person. Perhaps God's focus today is on the one person that's you. What are you going to do with the evidence for the resurrection? Because what this passage then shows, and this is where we're going to close, is there's a real blessing that comes from belief. Verse 28, we see that Thomas does stop doubting. He does believe. He stands in this wonderful, clear certainty that Christ has become my Lord and my God. Not somebody out there, not somebody who's for other people, but personally, my Lord and my God. And Jesus then in verse 29 reminds us that throughout the ages, from that point on, throughout the rest of human history, there is a blessing for all who will believe. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have.
believed. And in many ways, this brings the whole of John's gospel to its climax, because throughout the gospel, again and again, he said that it's belief, belief in Christ, belief in what he has done, belief in who he is, that gives a new meaning, a new purpose, a new hope to life. The very beginning of the gospel, in chapter 1, verse 12, he says this. To all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a, hus or a husband's will, but born of God. And then the, that's the most famous verse in the whole of John's Gospel, John chapter 3, verse 16. Let's read verse 15. It says this. Everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. The blessing that comes from belief is a blessing of life. It's spoken of in one place in life in all its fullness. It's spoken of as eternal life. It's spoken as part of from passing from death to life. But simply, gloriously, it is life itself. It's this new life that starts with a new birth. Uh, Jesus talked to a man called Nicodemus about that. It's a life that involves knowing God. And it's a life preparing us for a home which is being prepared for us in heaven. It's a life that enables us to live for Christ here on earth and with Christ in glory. And it is this life which Thomas and the other disciples have come to know by, well, by the only way that you can know it, by believing in Christ. So in John chapter six and verse 29, Jesus says this, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. And again and again and again. That is the crux, the crucial thing that uh, John emphasizes throughout his gospel. So he says in verse 31, these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. I wonder if you've come to the point of that blessing, of believing in Christ, of knowing that he has opened a way for you to know God here on earth, and also as you pass from earth, most of us through death, perhaps some uh, when the Lord returns, that you pass into God's presence for all eternity, to be welcomed by him, to be given a home prepared for you in heaven, and to come into the place where there are no more tears, there's no more pain, only a place of righteousness and of joy for all eternity. That was what Thomas came to know as he acknowledged that he had to stop doubting and believe. And throughout the last 2000 years, many, many, many have come to know that for themselves. People from all around the world, people from all walks of life, people from all different circumstances. Because all that is required, all that God calls on us to do is to believe to put our trust in him. And then as we put our trust in him to see our lives transformed, the writer C.S. Lewis, the one who, the man who wrote the, the Narnia books, who wrote a whole range of other things, who was a great uh, speaker for the Christian faith. At first, he didn't want to know anything about Christianity. He too, like Thomas, rejected what he'd heard. But when he did come to know Christ, he described that experience as being surprised by joy. And that has been true for Christians again and again and again over the last 2000 years. Whatever's been going on in the circumstances around them, whatever circumstances they find themselves in, however difficult things may be, in Christ there is joy. 
It's a surprising joy. It's a wonderful joy. It's a new life that comes when, like Thomas, we stop doubting and believe. I trust that you know that joy this morning. And I trust that God will continue to walk with you in that joyous relationship until the day comes when we see him face to face. And I hope the next time, well, not next Sunday, because I'm here next Sunday as well, but the next time we may actually be able to meet face to face and share something of that joy and the wonder of knowing him together. Thank you. May God bless you in the weeks that lie ahead. Let's pray together. Father, thank you that you have indeed prepared a new life for each and every one who puts their trust in you. We thank you that that new life is a life that has blessings beyond number, things that we could never know outside of your love. And that like C.S. Lewis, we too can be surprised by the joy that you came for us to know. Amen.